Robot lawnmower. Solar panel robot. Table tennis robot. Tiny fighting robot. Just a robot. I've come to the world's biggest technology show, CES, to find out if AI is ready to escape the screen and enter the real world. There's no shortage of robots, but are they any good? So, um, yeah, like, I don't want to disappoint anyone who's really excited about these robots, but you might have spotted a guy with a remote control operating it once it got outside of its little routine. And that is often what goes on with these things. It can do one little bit by itself, but the moment it gets outside that, you need a human to do it for it. <laughs> Being the most hyped thing at CES is honestly actually quite a curse because there have been so many examples of things that have got CES super excited and turned into nothing. But the reason that it might be worth thinking seriously about robots is because there is one example where it really works at a mass scale in a way that is going to change possibly everyone's lives. I'm talking about driverless cars, which are already roaming the streets of several US cities. This is the new one that Uber will be operating in San Francisco. And this is the man who developed the software. How come driverless cars seem so good when a lot of other robots seem actually quite basic? Well, I'm never going to talk smack about other robots. I love robots. Uh, for the record, for all the future robots out there, once they uh, are in control, like, uh, I love robots. So, but what about this problem? It means that it can be tackled in the way that, say, like folding laundry, is actually really difficult. We've had so much dedicated effort of incredibly brilliant people working on this specific problem. If we had put all of that effort purely into laundry folding, I think we would be there with that too. The thing about driverless cars, when you've been in them a little bit, you stop caring and they're driverless. It doesn't seem to matter at all. You just stop thinking about it. And that is in a way why I think they're so significant because they've passed what you might call the physical Turing test. You can't really tell the difference. So what does this mean for our robot future? I found a good person to ask. Waiting for the big man. That's Jensen Huang's chair over there. He's the CEO of NVIDIA and, I don't know, maybe the most powerful person in tech right now. Happy New Year. Great to see you. Hi, Jensen. Ronald Manthorpe, of Sky News. Um, I know you're really excited about physical AI, but when I try robots on the show floor, they are often pretty rudimentary, really. When do you think we're going to get robots that actually have human-level capabilities? Next year. Can you elaborate? Why is that? Oh, because, because um, yeah, yeah, oh, this year, yeah, this year. Um, because, because I know how fast the technology is moving. You're going to see some pretty amazing things. The reason that I think that people like Jensen Huang are so confident about robotics is because it feels like that the core technological problems are really being cracked. So these are NVIDIA's most powerful new chips. They're 10 times more powerful than the last ones. Once you've got them and you've uh, bundled them all together into a whole load of these, which is what you get in a data center, well then, you can use a load of data to teach an AI about the world. And when once you've done that, you can put that AI model on another chip and put that on the robot so that it runs locally on the, on the device, which is so important because, I mean, you know, you can't be going up to the cloud to ask, what should I do when you're just about to crash into someone or something like that. And if you think about it, once you've taught a robot about the world and then put that more AI model on the device, what you've really done is you've given the robot a brain. And once they've got brains, well, the sky's the limit. I think in general, everybody who is in this industry, who's on the frontier of this research, believes we now have the basic ingredients to build everything we need for the kinds of robots we've been imagining. This is what they're imagining at Boston Dynamics, arguably the world's leading robotics company. Oh, and they've got humanoids too. That might be the most advanced robot in the world right now. So there was a moment there that um, I thought really got to the heart of 
the challenge in robotics right now. So the spot dogs did this incredibly technically sophisticated dance. It was, it was impressive. And then one of them opened a door and honestly, it was so painfully slow. Even though they probably set all this up, done it all prepped and everything, but it was so slow. And this is the challenge, right? Because robots can do things that we find really hard. The things that we find easy are actually really difficult for them. You know, I bet if someone had walked on stage during that dance, the robots would have just bashed into them because they probably didn't really have an understanding of the whole world. They were just doing their pre-programmed movements. That's what I would guess anyway. And doors, yeah, doors of the world. This guy in the white t-shirt is Boston Dynamics founder, Robert Plater. A uh, question for Robert. When do you think that robots like Atlas will be able to operate in the home? Like, when am I gonna get my robot butler? We think that's the wrong strategy. Uh, and there's a few reasons. One is that uh, the home consumer market will be very cost sensitive. And those early robots typically are not cheap. They're expensive. Safety is paramount. I can't wait to have a robot that's helping lift me out of bed when I'm 20 years from now, right? But that's a really critical safety issue. All of these mean we think you need to start an in industry. So we're building the robot brains right now. The first applications of these that are going to be widespread are going to be in industry. We, see, we believe they're going to be inside factories, inside warehouses, doing jobs that we have labor shortages for. The reason factories work so well is because they're a bit like roads, mostly controlled environments where the goals are very clear. So I guess if you want to know what the immediate future of robotics looks like, it's probably a lot more like this. Not as cool, not as futuristic, but a lot more functional. And maybe in some ways more impactful because sure are a lot of factories. And a lot of people who work in factories. I know a lot of people are worried about job losses. What's your response to that? I think it's going to be exactly the opposite. Having robots will create jobs. And the reason for that is, number one, as you know, we have a labor shortage in the world, not by one or 2,000 people, by tens of millions of people. And it's getting, getting, going to get worse. And so we need to have more, you know, if you will, AI immigrants to help us uh, in the manufacturing floors and do the type of work that, that maybe we decided not to do anymore. Do you, do you mind if I just ask quickly about job losses? Obviously, working in industry with these generalizable robots, a lot of people are worried about that. What, what do you say to them with their concern, those concerns? So I think there's a huge opportunity to really let the robots do the true, dull, dirty, and dangerous stuff. Let people manage robots, build robots, service robots, and it'll be a higher reward and this is, this is an entirely new industry that didn't exist a few years ago. So we're gonna build an entirely new industry. So I actually think there's a huge opportunity for job growth. So you're not worried about it then? I am not. Whatever happens, one thing's for sure. We're walking into uncharted territory with our new robot companions.